It's wonderful to know God. It's revolutionary to know God. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. Before I go further, can anybody testify that they found rest for their souls in Jesus? And this statement was made more than 2,000 years ago. And it's still valid today. That's why we say the word of God is living. It's alive. It speaks not just then. It speaks to us now. And it will continue to speak. Praise your name, God. I propose for you to understand that as I explain in time that I have here, Jesus is saying he's inviting. He's laying an invitation out that we would journey with him. In pursuit of something. He's, yeah, he's asking that we journey with him in pursuit of something. And that something is called sanctification. So for some of us, we may have thought that the, the, the journey is about heaven. And while that's a delightful thing to think about, it's not actually the, the journey. Heaven is like the retirement package for Christians. Once you've signed up, you're entitled to heaven, right? But that's not the destination. Here's what Jesus is saying. Come all who are weary, burdened. That's the invitation. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And here he says in verse 29, learn from me. He wants you to learn from him. So the invitation to follow after Christ is one where you would be committing yourself to learning as you grow. And that's the meat of Christianity. That's where the bulk of Christian life would be lived in learning as we grow. Learning as we grow. As I said last time, I spoke about God in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20. God revealed himself to the people and he says to you, before he just lists his rules and his constitution, God is saying, I am the God who rescued you. So when God identifies himself to us, it is intentional. He says his name is the I am. So he says Yahweh. When Moses is asking, who do I call you? So God is just saying, that I don't want you to be mistaken about me. I want you to know who I am. So your worship will be intentional and direct. Not happenstance. You don't accidentally end up worshiping God like a misfiring. It must be directed to him. So you worship him with the knowledge and the understanding. And this is what God was introducing to himself. Now Jesus is saying, in following suit, he's saying, come to me. And I am the one who's going to give you rest. You who are weary and burdened. That's not a claim that many could make. I can't make that claim. I can't tell you, come to me and I will relieve you. I'm not your burden bearer. But I know who is. I could point you to the one. And Jesus spoke at very humble and subtle, clear points about the authority that he had. He said, it's a guarantee. He's making a guarantee. No disclaimer, no fine print. Come to me and I will. I will do it. He's going to do it. And that's his assurance that he's making. Just like when God said to them, I am the God who heard you and I delivered you. God introduces himself to us in our situation. But when he introduces himself and he says, listen, I would like for you to do so and so, so and so, so and so. He's laying out then the constitution, how this relationship is going to go. And Jesus is saying, come, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. So it's not just a, a, an invitation to come to the altar for prayer and return to your seats. It's an invitation to come and begin to follow after him. Take up your cross daily. We talked about that last time. Because the rules that he set, the Ten Commandments, were trying to restructure how we see relationships as they should be. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to teach you. 
So the Christian journey is an invitation to journey with Christ for the rest of your days. Not just come to the altar. Not just come and have bread and fish one time. That's involved in it, but the whole, the meat of it is that we would do something together. Him as the teacher. Him as the Savior. Him as the Lord. Us as his students. Us as his followers. Us as servants. How many of you like that word servants? How many of you like to think of yourself as servants? In youth meeting on Friday, I said, you know, the royal priesthood is an attractive title because they have royal. And we think about priestly garb and prestige. But we really are servants. Because Jesus himself said that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to do what? Seek. Seek that which is lost. I bless his name. So, I would like to say to you that in local plans, if you've ever asked generally, Trinidadians would say, where are you going? If you're leaving the office, you're stepping out the house, where are you going? I'm going right there to come back. You familiar with that? I'm going to come back. Sometimes they don't say where they're going. Right there to come back. As if the coming back is the whole essence of leaving. I'm not really leaving for anything. I'm really going that I may come back. Because we emphasize on the comeback, right? Right. But when you go to Jesus, don't go to come back. Go to continue. Go to continue. When you've done that trade where Jesus relieves you and he exchanges your burden and he gives you rest, don't go back for it. Don't go back where you purchased that load, that heavy burden, where you were heavy laden and cumbered. And don't go back and purchase some more. Don't go back. Stay with Jesus. Stay when you've been delivered. Stay when you've been relieved. Continue with him and experience growth. That's what worshiping God as a lifestyle is about. It's about revisiting our priorities, rearranging our daily schedules in order that we give God that time of priority in our lives. So it's not possible that you could go worship Jesus and come back. Come back and just be yourself. It shouldn't be possible. So relationship is saying that there is an obligation then. So Jesus is saying, come. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Where's the importance of the yoke? And I think this is where we may just want to share a little longer. What's the importance of this yoke? Well, the yoke has different connotations. In the Bible, it is an emblem of bondage for slavery. It's an emblem for affliction or cross. It's an emblem of punishment of sin. The yoke represents a emblem of the commandments of God and it's also a legal ceremony. Yoking was necessary for beasts of burden. Yoking is important for the work that we're called to do. Yoking was done by the one in charge, the owner, the master, the Lord. So coming is voluntary, yoking is not. So when you come to him, it is to be yoked. Because that's part of the invitation. Come all who are weary, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. So Jesus is saying, come. I will be your Lord. I will be your leader. It says in the book of Romans, I believe, it, to, we are slaves to whom we obey. So he's saying, come and give me your obedience that you may be my servant. But that's not the end of it there. You see, he's already in the opening part, he said, he already gave a disclosure about himself. I'm not here just to rule and dominate over you. Some of you have become burdened because of your own pursuits. Some of you have become burdened because of your own ambitions. Some of you have been desperately trying to serve God. Religiously, nobly. But you've become weary. Some of you are just like that. Lost. Signal is gone. You're between two points where you're last connected and you hope you connect soon. But I praise God that when he says come, it's an assurance that he will. He will. He will. So yoking was necessary for training the animal how to. But in that statement of yoking, God is saying, Jesus is saying that I am gentle. He is saying I am gentle. 
I am humble in heart. What's the significance of that kind of a offer to us, that kind of description of himself? Is that a God who has all this sovereign power, a God who wields this divine strength, a God who, of all that he is, the omnipotence, Jesus is saying himself, I'm humble. He's disclosing a character before you. And he's trying to now lay for us a groundwork as how we should start to groom ourselves characteristically. So that we who follow Christ, we who are yoked by Christ, should begin to reflect Christly character. And among it should be names like humble. Among it should be names like gentle. Not bubbly. No, no. You have authority. In other words, one of the descriptions of meekness in the Bible is one who has a sword but keeps it in his sheath. So it's not an imps like Good Friday. It's one who knows that this sword could do damage. But I'm choosing another tactic. And that's how we are to be in this world. That's how we are to carry about ourselves in this world because we have understood that these things come about here. This spiritual work that we're doing here it entices us, but at the same time, it can ensnare us. So we have to be humble. We have to be gentle with people. We don't just go criticizing everybody from the external. We approach with caution and love. Jesus had a comparison with his humble, his way that he would want to lead us. And then the Pharisees in Matthew 23 it's just said that they tire people with heavy burdensome loads and lay them on their shoulders and they don't even lift a finger to help move them. And the Pharisees were the designated religious leaders at the time. So they lay rules upon rules upon rules upon rules upon rules on the people, making worship no longer enjoyable. It's almost preventing people from enjoying worship in spirit. Because I have so many protocols to follow. So many things that I have to do that I can't enjoy the worship of God. And the position where God is saying here that, when Jesus is saying, and I will find rest for your souls, is connected to when in Jeremiah, the picture is like this. Anybody here? Well, I don't raise hand. We have teenagers in here, right? Good. And those who are older than teenagers, you remember your teenage days, right? And those who are younger, you'll be teenagers one day. What in passing this year? The description here is in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is a prophet with a very hard task. Jeremiah is a prophet who is sent unto people who are in the full swing and heat of rebellion. They are enjoying the way that it is going, being rebellious from God. They are benefiting. They are seeing themselves distant from God, but they are okay with it. And Jeremiah has a job to go among them and call them back. Go among them and proclaim the word of God to them. Go among them and declare righteousness again. Nobody wants to hear righteousness. That's like you're talking about um, being conservative on Carnival Monday. Why people jumping up? You all be conservative in a dress style, you know? Cover up a little bit now. Nobody wants to hear you at that time. That's the wrong time for you. Go from here. So picture Monday and Tuesday, everywhere you go in Trinidad and Tobago, and then God calls you and says, listen, I want you to go and tell these people that I'm a God of righteousness and holiness, and you are my people, and you are a royal priesthood unto me, and you are a holy nation, and I want you to be set apart and dedicate yourself in, in, in modesty. Oh, glory be to God. God is saying, and that's, what, and that's the role that Jeremiah had to fulfill. So they, they were kind of familiar when Jesus is now extending this offer and saying, you will find rest for your souls. Because here's how it is in Jeremiah chapter 6. The Lord says to Jeremiah, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where God's way is. And walk in it. And here you will find rest for your souls. But the people said, no, we will not walk in it. And what I'm saying about teenagers is that sometimes in that journey through teenage period, we enter into strange rebellious strands, strikes, right? Somehow you become a teenager and voyaging between your prepubescence and your adulthood, there's this pulling and tugging that happens. Where you just become supernaturally wise by the day, so the parents who brought you this far have become obsolete. And friends who have not experienced anything that you're experiencing now have answers for you. And unfortunately, somehow this age has a harder fight because now with Google, you have more information Minus any sort of context for it. So now, you know better than everybody. 
nobody could come to you. I went to a doctor's office and he had his certificates up on the back. And one of them saying, not certified by Google. He was saying most people come there and they already diagnose themselves, so they just come for the prescription. So in Jeremiah's day, these people already made an assessment of themselves. And the old way that is spoken about here, the good way, is the way that God had set for them. They were people given the scriptures. God revealed himself. Exodus, remember we talked about that? God gave them instructions, commandments. How are you to worship me? How are you to live with one another? What you're not to do? And God kept adding on commandments to them because as time passed and they distanced themselves from God, he had to add on and add on. This is what happened with them now. They came to a place where they couldn't, they had a crossroad. And the way, the old way is the reliable way. That's the way of parents. That's like teenagers having to come and ask their parents, can I do X, Y, Z that everybody else is doing? And the parents saying, really, it's not the right thing to do. And, you know, we, we don't do those kind of things. You're a Christian. You're a young woman of God. You're a young man of God. How does that reflect the glory of God if you do these things? And they're saying, what kind of old, my parents are real prudish, yeah, boy. And that's what's happening there. The, the way of God was too old for them. It's like teenagers in that kind of rebellion where it's not pleasant. It doesn't entice. It doesn't hold any savor. And this is the same common way that we end up ourselves, we end up enticed or entangled in the snares of the world. This is how we become burdened now. And then God, being the gracious God he is, in Jeremiah's time, he allowed them continue in your way because before, even before that he said the conditions that if you obey me, this will happen. If you disobey, this will happen. And they were going into captivity soon. They were about to be led into captivity. Jeremiah knew it. They didn't care for the warning of God, so they reaped the punishment of God. Kind of like teenagers again, you know? They don't heed their parents. They don't listen. No, you're not old enough to drive. You don't, no, no, you don't have a license. No, don't do this. And then they go and get an accident and they call daddy. Where are you? Had a little accident. You know, like a, a, a child toddler wet their pants? Had a little accident. Just a little scratch. Just a little. And the, the interesting thing about this, what we're captivated by is that what God is calling us to is the same thing he promised from beforehand, so it's nothing new. This is what God intended for us from since the garden. This is what God promise the people who would follow after him. This is what is conditionally going forward for us. If we obey God, this is what God is calling us to. So he's saying, take my yoke upon you. Yoke yourself to me. Become one who follows after me. Let me lead you. Let me instruct you. Let me be your teacher. Learn from me. In inside of there too, implicit in that is this. As you walk with Christ after your moment at the altar, after your regeneration, after your conversion, you're supposed to be growing constantly in Christ. You're supposed to be growing constantly in Christ. If we understand, remember the, the analogy when your yoke animals, you'd yoke an older one with a younger one. Right? You'd, you'd yoke one who knows so that they'll calm the one who doesn't know. Right. And that's what happens when we keep the yoke of Christ on. We begin to mature and blossom and reflect this Christianity. So therefore, others are able to see it in us more readily. So the old things passed away. It is like the promise that is made as the, at the altar that a man would say to his wife, I promise that I do so and so, so and so, so and so. And, you, and he said, yes, I do. And the wife says the same thing, right? So it's like that. What they say at the altar is what they're supposed to be now living for the rest of their days. Right? It's like a trust fall for the rest of your life. Every day is a trust fall. Because what you said at the altar, even though you didn't fully comprehend what would entail when you say for better or for worse, how worse is worse? You know what I mean? This is, this is what was going on. These are the considerations that were being made here. That as you are yoked to Christ, you are growing in Christ. You're supposed to be modeling after Christ. You're supposed to be now leading as an example. You're supposed to be able to take a younger one under you and teach them Christian concepts, Christian behaviors, Christian doctrine. You're supposed to be responsible like that. So therefore, in our Christian journey, it's not just about us needing and wanting a loan from God. It's about us being able to give to others what God has given to us. And that is where the Christianity blossoms. 
that's where we go into full bloom state. When each one now comprehends what God has asked them to and begins to serve one another. Sounds familiar, right? This is what Jesus Christ prayed before his ascension in John chapter 17. Make them one. Make them one, God. Make them one. You will know me by the way you love one another. Those who don't show love, um, virgin, those who do not love, do not know God. Those who continue to indulge and enjoy sin day after day, they not, they don't know God. Because you see, that knowing God, that yoke to Christ, what Christ has called yoking, being yoked to him, he's asking us now, come. He's doing an exchange. He's trading what you had for what he has. And it has conditions because every relationship has conditions. Every relationship fit a function has conditions. Even among gangs, they have conditions. They have codes. So why should it be different in Christianity? Why should we have a Christianity that doesn't have laid upon us requirements? And in any institution, any organization, you'll be able to determine where you are in some broad sense, right? Are you here or are you here? Maybe I'm in the middle. So therefore, in Christianity, we should endeavor to be able to identify, where am I? Am I growing on the curve still? Have I stagnated somehow? Am I on my retirement where I'm declining? Going down? Losing? Where are we? And how are we taking it in Christ? Beloved, being called by God has divine authority. It's God's capacity to draw us out of darkness into full fellowship with him, into full fellowship with his kingdom. Everybody hears the call. Some will answer. Just like the wedding, the wedding feast. Some will answer. We choose whether we want to respond. And after having respond, we are told to read and consider. Read and consider. So what are we here for? What are we here for? When we come to Christ, what are we here for? Why do we stumble so often? Why are we like Paul often where he say, why are you kicking against the guards or the pricks? Why are you having taken up the yoke upon you? Why is there such rebellion among us? Why is this nature still having victory in our lives after we proclaim and declare that victory already belongs to Jesus and we are his? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Why are we not moving? Why are we not moving? Why are we not manifesting the works? Not the works, the fruit of the spirit. Why is it that the works of the flesh still dominate? The book of James, it says, those who have faith must have works. Some say, well, no, it's about, it's about my heart and I'm serving Jesus in my heart. He says, no, you must have works because if it is, you don't have any works. Your faith is what? Dead faith. Dead faith. If I say that I love Lila and I want to I want to marry and be a good husband, and then every day for the rest of our lives, I do zero to romance her, zero to care for her, zero. And you'll find out this. You'll be disappointed, not so? We could be honest. If you all came over by me for lunch, and you say, Sister Lila, oh, Pastor Homer, he's, he's a gentleman, eh? He's so polite and thing. She said, mm-mm. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. He said, that man never once tell me, please. If you have to ask twice, somebody going and get real up. The children frightened to play with him. When you hear that kind of testimony, even when I preach with oratory precision and skill, you're going to reject my words because now what's going to happen is that you're saying this man's life is out of line with what he's preaching. There's no power in his words. So he is not preaching a life that is being lived out. He's a fraud. And he's a fraud. He's worse than a politician. Yes, because remember they have a, a ethics of their own. We have a ethics of the kingdom of God. We have bylaws that are clearly stated and able to be understood. We don't have any new writings here. This book has been closed. The canon has been closed. So we have no new rules for how we should be living as Christians. It is clearly set before us. We all have been invited to participate. And God is saying, having come to me, don't just come for your bread and your fish experience. If you're saying you want Christ in your life, you want to be delivered, you want to be healed. Here's what he's saying. 
those who come to me for this exchange are going to take up the yoke. Do you agree? Therefore, having agreed, walk with me now. I am your teacher. I am your Lord. There is no separation of the identity of Lord and Savior. He is both because it's how it is packaged. That's how it's packaged. And that's his offer to us. And that is what he's presenting to us. He's presenting to us a God who says, come. Just as you are. Don't get good. Don't get no skill. Don't think you have to come to church to be anything. Come. Just come. Yes, I know your life is, you run up a whole lot of problems and this and that. Come, that's fine. Come. Come. You've been rejected. Come, just come. Come. He says, come. I'll do the fair exchange for you. I'll trade you your burdens. I'll give you, and you see, he's giving us one that is light and easy. One that is light and easy, but we still have to carry it. We still have to carry it because, you see, it affects the world that we live in. It doesn't affect God differently. It doesn't change God when we don't fulfill the call of our lives. It changes somebody or it disadvantages somebody in the environment. How do we know this? Think about 12 men followed after Jesus for three years or so. And God said to them, this is what you need to do. Go wait. Wait. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. And when he has come, you'll have courage. You'll have, you'll have boldness to go and proclaim the gospel. What if they stayed in that room, fearing for their lives because death was a real threat? What if they said, oh boy, Jesus really going to know? Yeah, look, he gone. Clouds close back up. Now, but I feel like going back and remain a fisherman. What if? And from 12 men, we're able now to have what? In here, how much times 12 already? That's the result of 12 people who remain faithful. Well, 11, who remain faithful. And then they get a replacement. So yes, 12. They remain faithful, right? So 12 faithful people under the apostleship or the, the one sent by God, right? Under that anointing, they transform so much of the world. From 12. In one sermon alone, 3,000 got saved. And that man was a big coward. That man was a big coward. That man rejected himself because he knew he denied Christ. Peter, remember? He denied Christ three times. So much so that when Christ said, Peter, do you love me? It was hurting him in his heart to look Jesus in the eye one on one and say, yes, I love you. Because he knew that he denied Jesus. And he knew that Jesus knew he denied him because Jesus said before it happened, you will deny me three times. But still, he found God faithful and stayed faithful to the call of God in his life. Allowed himself to be processed. He took his yoke up and he carried it out. And that same coward who ran, who fleed, who deserted Jesus is the same one who said when he was before the courts, it's better that we, what? It's better that we obey God than man. Look at the transformation that came in his life. And it is possible for all of us. It is possible for all of us. So there I say I'm encouraging you that when you think about the call of God, when you think about being saved, when you think about Jesus being a deliverer, a healer, think about it as this. It's just the beginning of a continual relationship. Now that I have been saved, now that I've been touched, now that I've been sanctified, I have a responsibility now. Who can I tell? Who can I lead to Christ? Who can I show the love of God to? How can this transform life that I now live be a reflection to somebody else in my area? How can I be the salt that slows the decay of the society that I'm a part of? God didn't call you to die on the cross to save everybody. He did it already. All he's calling you to do is proclaim. Proclaim. In your words, in your speech, in your thinking, in your life, proclaim. And that's what I'm asking you there to consider. If you're not already walking fully after God, Maybe you're not sure if I am. I'm asking you, please, take your yoke upon you. Take your yoke upon you. It is light. It is easy to carry. Don't forget that we came in here weary and heavy laden. Come, bud. Some of us will. Hmm. 
ashamed of ourselves. Now Christ has given us a reason to be proud of ourselves. Let's fulfill the call that God has called us as a church community. There's a lot that we can do. Going to this rally might just be the turning point for some of you today. There's a lot that we can do. Can you stand with me as I like to close in prayer? Father, in the name of